Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We're continuing on with our 10 core values, and we're up to number six now. Last week was just so fitting, as you, if you were here last week, we had um, another church combined with us, LifeGate, and joined us last week. And it was, it was a great time, and the message had to be on the faith and community of the BIC. It was perfect for that. Today, we're going to be talking about witnessing to the world. And this is a good one, witnessing to the world. There's, there's many ways of taking our message across of witnessing to the world, and there's a theme for this. There's a theme that the message is witnessing, to, witnessing about Jesus Christ. We've got to remember that when you witness. There's a power for our witness, and it's through the Holy Spirit. You've got to let the Holy Spirit consume you so you may be able to witness. There's a validity of the witness, and it'll be shown through the way you live your lives. People in the world are watching us. See how we live our lives as a Christian person. This book here is available to you. It's called Focus on Our Faith, Brethren of Christ, Core Values. If anybody would like a copy of this, feel free to see me. We have them in the office here. This really explains what the Brethren of Christ is really about, what our core values are really about, and what we need to really focus on. In this book, on the chapter under Witnessing to the World, there's, a, uh, there's an author, two authors, uh, Bill Heidels and Mark Middleberg, and they write this little saying in here. There's nothing like the adventure of being used by God to contagiously spread his love, truth, life to other people, people who deeply matter to him. Everybody matters to Jesus Christ, and we need to be sharing this. The first chapter of the book it also states, entering into a new relationship with God through salvation is an awesome experience. The brethren in Christ firmly believe that this is a wonderful relationship is designed for every person on the planet, bar none. It's just well said. So we're going to look at the word witnessing. What does witnessing mean? The spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the goal of converting the listener. There's usually three different ways that this occurs. Number one is you actively persuade, you pursue the unsaved. Number two, they seek you. And number three, they see how you live. Number three can be an out sometimes. And when we get into that, you'll see why. We're going to look at number one. We pursue the unsaved. The Great Commission. We are commissioned to do this. If we get to the book of Acts, it's where we are called to do our job, to work. If you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you learn so much about the Lord Jesus Christ, what he'd done for us. But now we're going to get into the Great Commission. We're going to look at Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Because we are given what is called the Great Commission. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. And you got to remember, this was given to the disciples after the crucifixion. And then is again repeated right before his ascension into heaven to his disciples. We're going to look at the book of Acts. I got a lot of scripture here today since we're speaking the book of Acts and we're jumping around. We're going to go to Acts 1, verse 8 and 9. And it says, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, to the, and even to the remote part of the earth. And after he has said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And this, of course, was commanded to him after his death and resurrection. 
I'm going to go back into verse 8. And it talks about witnessing to all of Jerusalem. Let me tell you now, your Jerusalem is right here in Elizabethtown. You need to get it right, right here in these four walls. Pastor Nick, a little while ago, did a demonstration of coming to church. And he brought a young man up front and he stuffed them with marshmallows. You remember that? He filled them up with marshmallows. And he says, you get so full of it in your head, but you're not allowing it to fill your heart. And you need to get that consumed of the word of God that you're willing to share it with everybody else. You just can't come to church and get fed on a Sunday morning. You come to be equipped with the word of God so you can go out and share the word of God. It's very important. There's many ways of actively spreading the word. Are you actively spreading the word right now? If you're actively spreading it, the people in Elizabethtown... Should be churches should be full right now. He also says to all of Judea and Samaria, maybe your Lancaster County is your Judea. Maybe your Harrisburg, maybe your surrounding states is your Samaria. Are we witnessing these people? I don't know if you notice behind me. There's two shepherd hooks and a world behind it. This is representing us being shepherds and witnessing to the world. It's what we're called to do. We have missionaries, and I believe, if I'm not right here, I believe there's like 72 families serving the brethren in Christ right now around the world, in Africa, Asia, Canada, right here in the United States. It's what we're called to do. How many people have you actively spread the word to now? How many have you brought the Christianity, brought them to church this week to get saved? This week, a year, maybe even a decade, have you ever brought anybody to the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus says something in Matthew 9, 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Then again, only a few will make it into the kingdom. Are you willing to go and be obedient to do what we're commissioned to do? Romans 9, 3 states... And this is Paul talking. And Paul states that he would go to hell to make sure everyone else goes to heaven. Wouldn't you want to have a heart like that to see everybody in the world saved and going to heaven? It's amazing. He didn't want to see anybody without Christ. There's many ways of going and taking your message to the world. And we're going to look into them. We're going to go to Acts 2. And we're going to go to verse 22 and 23. And then we're going to continue on to 36 and 41. This is Peter. He's preaching to the crowd after the crucifixion. Okay? And Peter says in 22, Men of Israel, listen to this. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. God did among you through him, and as yourself known, the man has handled, handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death and nailed him to a cross. Let's go to 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of For what you and your children and for all are far off. For all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he wanted them and pleaded them with them. Save yourselves. This is corrupt generation. There is is who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 of them were added to the number that day. Now... Peter has a little style of preaching. Peter is one of those in-your-face guys. 
I would think he's more like a Pentecostal guy. If you see Jesse when he's preaching, he gets, he gets pretty wound up. I could, see, I could see Peter. I could see Peter being that way. Peter getting a little wound up. He was in your face. You and the wicked people put Jesus Christ on the cross. You need to repent right now. You need to get Jesus in your heart right now. You crucified our Savior. He was one of those fire and brimstone preachers. Have you ever seen one of them? I heard them growing up. I remember sitting on a couch at home when I was young and seeing one on TV. I thought this preacher had an anger management problem. He's, he's yelling, he's slamming things. And it's like, but you know, he got the word across. He really got the word across. And that's his style of preaching. That's the way he got to spread the word. But then we look at Paul. And we're going to go back to, we're going to look into Acts 17. And we're going to go to verse 2 of 4. See, Paul uses a little different method. Paul's more of a laid back guy. He's more of a guy who persuades his listeners into becoming followers. So let's see what he says in 2 and 4 in chapter 17. And you got to remember, he's in Thessalonica right now, and he's going into a Jewish synagogue to speak. And he says, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on the three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from Scripture, explaining and proving that Christ had suffered and rise from the dead, then Jesus, I am proclaiming to you in this Christ, he said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and it did a number of of God-fearing Greeks. He used a whole different style. He used scripture. He used the word of God to talk to them. He wasn't one of those in-your-face guys yelling and hollering. He was more laid-back type guy, and it worked for him. That was his way of getting his message across. There's so many different ways of getting your message across. And you got to sit down and think about your way of how you're going to reach people out there. Remember that Paul tells us to do whatever is necessary to reach the unsaved. Some will be reached by fire, some by logic, and some by other methods. And that is found in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. For others, it is to take, is take the form of sowing a seed to leave, be believed and be reaped by others at a much later time. And a good example is this. When we did our community service in the park, some of us had t-shirts that says, don't just go to church, be the church. And on the back there was a message out of Acts. You're wearing them shirts around now. During town, people see that. And they might be walking in behind you and see that Bible verse, and it might stick in their mind, and then later on, they might need that. It's in the form of billboards. Going out to Roxbury Camp, I don't know if you noticed this. I noticed this when I was going out there and helped clean up day. Going out the turnpike, there's a billboard on the left-hand side, and it states, Jesus saves, with a phone number underneath it to contact the church. Then there's another one also going out a little further closer to the Blue Mountain on the other side that has a Bible verse on it. Those there are seeds that are planted that might be reaped at another time. There's, there's other ones, forms of message. You might be hauling somebody in your car who might be a non-Christian and you have a Christian radio station on. There might be a song that hits them that later on, that song come back to them. There's, a, there's other ones, books, pamphlets, movies that you might go see. Even bathroom stalls. I'm telling you, I, look, I was a truck driver for 23 years. I've been to many truck stops. I don't know if you've ever been in a truck stop and you used their bathrooms. There's a lot of graffiti and obnoxious stuff written on the stalls inside. But sometimes in the middle of all of that, you might see a little heart drawn in there with a saying that says, God loves you. Out of all that mess on there, that might have just planted a seed for somebody at a later time. Might be having a bad day, and out of all that mess on there, they see that. That's a seed planted to be reaped at another time. And these messages are, are for us to share with others. You might be spreading seeds out there that you don't even know, but you got to understand they're pricking the hearts to those who really need it. There's people that need it and then later on it comes back 
to, to help them out. Let's go on to number two, Mike. Sometimes they seek you out. In Acts 13, 7, someone came to Paul and Barnabas and sought to hear the word of God. What if this happened to you? Would you be prepared to share with that person? Could you lead them to the Lord? If somebody come up and ask you a question, are you ready to answer them? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, to Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth to not be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. Be prepared by knowing the word. If a non-Christian comes up and asks you a question and you, and you don't have the answer, you've got to find the answer for them. You're a workman. So work. Do your job. Don't just pray for your neighbors and your relatives to get saved. Witness to them. You got a witness to them. James 2.20, faith without works is dead. It is dead. You are God's workman. Don't just take them to your pastor. Do it yourself. Too many people think that you want to get somebody saved, you need to take them to your pastor. Everybody was called in the Great Commission to be a disciple of the world. Everybody. So we need to witness to them. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asked you a reason for the hope that you're in with meekness and fear. So when that person asked you, hey, why are you different than anybody else? You need to have a good answer. And it's a great opportunity to speak to somebody. How many had an opportunity and left to get away from you? I've done it. I'll tell you what, I was in a subway and there are two kids debating about something for school. And they're talking about this issue with transgender stuff. And one of the boys I could tell was a Christian kid and he was sticking to his faith for a while, but the other kid apparently wasn't. And he was talking to him about, well, no, I think it's okay. And he started persuading the other boy. And the boy at that time says, well, maybe you're right. The Christian boy's going, I think maybe you're right. And he was kind of lost. I was back a few people in line. There was an opportunity for me to step in and witness to that and help that young boy out. But I left to get away because they ordered their subs and out they went. But that was a missed opportunity. I wasn't going to allow that to happen again. I was out at Darren Camps and shopping at Darren Camps before they closed. And when I'm shopping, you can ask my wife, I like to sneak things into the cart. And when you, <laughs> you, you get up to the counter and it's, it happened to be a day that was pour down raining outside. The weather's miserable. The guy at the counter must have been having a bad day, the cash register. And... I get up there and I'm smiling because I know I just got some tasty cakes and stuff I threw in the cart my wife didn't know about. So, <laughs> so and as they're getting put up there, my wife Tony goes, where'd this come from? I don't know, it must just fall off a shelf into the cart, I don't know. But, <laughs> but I started laughing and smiling and the young boy behind the, at the cash register at the time goes, I don't know what you're so happy about, what you're smiling about. The weather outside's a mess. It was a miserable day. Things aren't going right here in the store. And I said, but you know what? It doesn't matter what the weather's like outside. When you're full of the Holy Spirit and full of Jesus, it doesn't matter what the weather is like outside. It doesn't matter. And I explained that to him. I said, look, man, I got Jesus in me, so it doesn't matter. I don't care if it's pouring. I don't care if it's, if it's 110 degrees outside. I love Jesus no matter what. That's what we're called to do. That's how we are as a witness that, that that boy there start to think about it. Maybe I need to think my change my attitude a little bit. So maybe that stuck with him a little later on that day. Maybe his attitude changed as the rest of the people are coming up through the line. That's what we're supposed to be doing. In Matthew 5, 13 through 16, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor without shall it be salted. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. If you sin in front of the unbelievers, it's nearly impossible to win them over. 
You are good for nothing in the Great Commission. How does salt get its saltiness back? How can you get your good name back once you've blown it in front of everyone? It's hard to do, even if at all. You are the light under the world. Everyone looks at the light upon the hill. The world looks at you and they make judgments constantly. Do not hide your light under a basket. If we hide our Christianity and act as the world does, and John talked about this the other week. He had a drawing up here out front and had one eye on the world and had one eye on Jesus Christ. It doesn't work that way. You need to be focused on Jesus Christ. When your eyes are focused on Jesus Christ, you're looking straight ahead at him. You're not worrying about what the world's doing. That's where we're supposed to be. When you hide your light, how are you supposed to witness to others? If you just hide your light and only uncover your basket on a Sunday morning. There's too many of us that do that. Show up on a Sunday morning, uncover our basket, and let our little light shine. As soon as you walk back out of church, you cover it back up. You go into the worldly mess. It's not what we're called to do. Called to let that little light shine every day till Jesus comes. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 states that we should abstain from all appearance of evil. Even look like we're a part of the world can sin, can, can cause you to sin. We're called to witness. If you are seeing people doing drugs and you are seen doing drugs, how are you going to tell that person to just say no? People are watching. So why don't we witness others? We know we're supposed to, so why don't we? What holds us back when we sit next to somebody on a bus or an airplane from talking with the person beside us? You know what witnessing is too? It's about loving the person, making conversation. And once you make conversation with them, then you can spread the word of God to them. Is it fear? Some of us have fear to spread the word of God. We're afraid that people are going to condemn you. And you're going to be condemned, I'm telling you. In Luke 12, 4, 4 to 12, it states in there that we cannot afford to be afraid. If we confess him before men, he will confess us before the Father. Are you confessing him before men? Are you willing to be rejected and made look foolish for the sake of obeying the Great Commission? Fear kept the evil servant in Matthew 25, 15 through 30 from multiplying his talents. He buried his talents out of fear and won no one, no new ones for his master. Don't get thrown where he got thrown because of fear. Even what he had was taken from him. He lost his salvation. Are you fear of being rejected? Some are going to reject your message, and that's okay. Not everybody wants to hear it. But be prompt in listening to the word of God when he is telling you he'll send you the right person when their soil is ready. We'll be persecuted. Take no fear of those who can destroy your body your reputation, your job, your career. But instead, be afraid of him who has commanded you to witness and you refused. Comes judgment to him. God's going to go, why didn't you witness for me? He's going to ask because we're called to do it in the Great Commission. Some of us will say, well, I don't have enough time. You weren't commanded to get a job or have a family or have a career, or have a hobby, or even sit in front of the television and watch the boob tube all day. That's, what we, that's not what we're commanded to do. We're called to spread the good news of the gospel until the ends of earth. Some of you say, well, I don't know how. How do I do this? How do I spread the word of God? Like I said earlier, too many folks 
bring the loss to the preacher and think it's not their job to get them saved. But it is your job. And there's many good perks for the person that you're witnessing to. God wants you to witness because of the benefits that that person will receive. I'm going to list a few of them. First of all, they become a child of God. Second of all, their bodies become temples of God. All their sins are forgiven. They begin to experience the peace and the love of God. They receive God's direction and purpose for their lives. They experience the power of God to change their lives. They have assurance of eternal life. Now, I know flow from progressive can give you insurance, but she can't give you eternal life. (laughs) God wants you to witness because of the benefits that you will receive. Witnessing will stimulate your spiritual growth. It'll lead you into prayer deeper. It'll lead you into studying God's word more and encourage you to depend on him more. There's some benefits to this. How does one lead someone to the Lord? Well, first of all, when you're talking to somebody, you can just let them know how much Jesus really loves them and how he can fill their lives with the peace and the love and the happiness. John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Share that with them. This verse stuck out to me for a while because when I was writing this over a month ago, I was working on this message. Every night when I would go to bed, my clock would say 10, 10. I thought it was broken. I said, what's wrong with this clock? Every night, 10, 10, I go, what's going on? I talked to Pastor Nick about it. Pastor Nick, he gave me some scripture and I looked at it, but you know what? None of them really stuck out until I started reading and all of a sudden a Bible verse popped up to me, John 10, 10. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That's why this is in this message today because we are supposed to share that with others that he's come that we can have life more abundantly. Let them know that we all have sinned. We all have made mistakes. We have all turned our backs on God by not obeying him. Romans 3.23, for we all sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Share that with them. Let them know that it's part, it's in the word. This disobedience is sin and it leads us to death. That's in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death. Let them know if you continue to sin, eventually you're going to die off with all that sin in you. You don't want to go where they went. But in spite of the sins against them, God wants them to know that they can know him personally, that he loves them enough that he sent his own son. Share that with them when you're sharing. That he bared all of our sins and he died so that we may be saved from our sins. Let them know that Christ died and did all the hard work for saving us. You got to need to let them know that they need to acknowledge that Christ died for them. He died for their sins and was resurrected in three days. They need to confess all their God. They need to confess to God that all their sinfulness can be taken away when they give their life to Christ. After you tell them all this and you share all these things with them, lead them in prayer. Teach them how to pray. Prayer is talking to God. You don't have to have no special thing written out. Pray to him. Speaking to God is prayer. Once you lead them to the Lord, then what? Say, you're on your own. Good luck. That's not how it works. Start taking them to church with you. Check up on them. I mean, seriously, check up on them. Just say, hey, I care about you, thinking about you. No, physically pick up the phone and call them, go visit them. It means a lot. Help them study the Bible. Remember, they're new Christians. They don't know how to do all this. Show them. Get them into some Bible studies with you. Give them some books or some Christian CDs to listen to. You've got to cut them some slack. They're going to make mistakes. Remember, they're newbies. And you were there once yourself. Start working on getting them filled with the Holy Spirit. Set a date and get them baptized. Witnessing to the world means we need to start doing our job. We need to start doing the Great Commission. Are you willing to do that today?
Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together. Thank you.